Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for Pass the Mic with Black Creatives. I'm Hannah Harris, a Business of Beauty and Fragrance student here at SCAD, and I'm so excited to introduce our next panel to you guys. In a moment, we'll hear from celebrity stylist and creative director Jason Bolden, fashion market director at Vanity Fair, Nicole Chapiteau, and editor-in-chief of Teen Vogue, Lindsay Peoples Wagner. Before we get started, we have another poll for you guys, so it should pop up on your screen right about now. And the questions we have are one, uh, what are you most excited to learn from these panelists? The breakthrough moments in their careers, how they create opportunities for other black professionals, the influence of social media, or how the fashion industry is responding to the Black Lives Matter movement. Answer now. We'll be taking audience questions after the panel, so be sure to use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Joining us as moderator, SCAD professor and footwear designer, Michael Mack. Welcome, Michael. Hi, how are you, everyone? And hi, Hannah. You did a great job on the last section. Thank you. Awesome, awesome. Um, so, you know, thank you and thank you to all of our panelists for joining us here today. I'm humbled by your talent and it's an honor to be in the conversation with you. Uh, your leadership continues to inspire us. Um, you know, just kind of getting into this, just to start off, uh, I see this as a conversation to help raise awareness, to educate, uh, to share experiences uh, with the hopes of invoking change. Uh, with that said, I would like to open the floor up to each of you to give your thoughts on this big moment in history that we all find ourselves in, in society and also in industry. Um, Nicole, would you like to start off? <laughs> um, I think it's, it's just really major. I think now, as opposed to years ago, is a time where we're actually gonna see change. And it's like, everyone has a time. We're, we're working from home. We're just so tired and we've been pushed to our, our brink. So we're, we're fighting, we're going to see the change. It's gonna be a long haul, but I think, I know it's all gonna happen. Okay, awesome. Thank you, and uh, Jason? I'm, listen, I'm extremely excited. I think it's the perfect time to create this shift. Uh, the support is amazing. I mean, I'm, I'm getting to chat and, and become even better friends with people like Nicole and Lindsay who are in, in my world. Um, so I'm excited and I think it, it's, it's the perfect time for change. Okay, thank you. Um, so we'll get into the first question. Uh, many of our students listening today are just starting off their journey. Uh, thinking back to, you know, what was the most pivotal or breakthrough moment in your career that led you to where you are today? And Jason, uh, would you like to start with that one? Sure, I can start. I think the, I think mine is a bit, it's, it's maybe three parts. Okay. The initial part was uh, having such an amazing family and having a push in the idea that I could be and become whatever it is that I ever dreamed of. I guess, the, and then that folded into me launching a store in New York with a thousand dollars and actually being the person who created the pop-up stores, which a lot of people don't know that, that I was one of the first people to do a pop-up store, starting off with a thousand dollars of vintage clothes. And then that kind of leading into meeting Gabrielle Union, who's one of my best friends and her giving me an opportunity, sending the elevator back down and giving me an opportunity to dress her for Art Basel. And that kind of, ex that, that was like a snowball effect for my career. And my career kind of ever from then to now, it's just been, it's been really amazing and it's been impactful by, by black women. So I'm really excited about that journey. Okay, thank you, thank you. And Nicole? Um I'd say it had an interesting start in, in this industry. I actually started out working in architecture um, and I might age myself, but it was during, I worked there during 9-11 okay. and I watched from, I was headed into the office and I watched it all unfold. And I sat there and I was just like, I, I don't like this job and I really need to pursue my dream. So it took me a little time, it took me like a year and then I quit. And I started working with a friend who was doing, she was working for Jabot Jeans and sending out stuff to design, to um, 
to celebrities. And back then it really wasn't influencers. It was like, oh, let's send them to this actress and this person. So we, we did that and it just started to snowball and I got an internship at Marie Claire Magazine. And I was fortunate enough that someone quit and I got hired and I really stood out as an intern. I made sure I was, when I was present, I was really present because I also had to work. I was a little bit older than everyone else. So, and from there, I just had like really great bosses who believed in me, who hired me when they could, who promoted me when they could. So I think that is really where I got my opportunity. Okay, and then let me just pass this to you and then we'll go back to Jason on this. Can you speak, you know, as a professor, I'm a new professor at SCAD. So I'm just say, exiting the fashion industry uh, as a footwear designer for 12 years and then coming into education. Can you speak to the students about work ethic um, and just how important that drive is and also work-life balance? Where, you know, where is that line? Wow, um, that's a many-fold question. I'm, I'm actually a mom of two so work-life balance I think for everyone is different um to me I like to limit you know this Jason knows too this is an industry well not right now because of COVID but where you can be eating breakfast lunch, and dinner out every single night there's always an event to go to there's trips there's things on the weekend so I like to just limit my time to doing those things like a certain few days a week and like making sure I can spend time with my kids because I had them so I can enjoy them. Like, I don't want to just be working, 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 but I also want them to see that I am a career woman. I'm really driven. I'm ambitious. So I think that's, I'm raising girls. So I think that's something important for them to see that they have a black mom who is out there working and working really hard. And as far as, um, I think it's like I was saying before, I think it's a, when you're at work, you need to be really present at work. It's not a time to be on TikTok. It's not a time to be on Instagram. <laughs> it's it's a time to be working. And I know Jason and I are from a different generation where it's like you kept your head down and you worked really hard. And and it shows like we're, we, we are making it really well in our career. And it's like, it's not a time for like complaining. I mean, there's certain things obviously like you need to talk to HR about, but it's not like, Ugh, I don't want to hang that thing. Like you, you have to do the work and, and work towards what you want to be and look at the people who like, you know, after I've done the work, this is the person I strive to be like, this is the career I want to have and see what their path was. None of them were sitting at home complaining that they, you know, had to lug around trunks or, you know, pack trunks. It's like, even as a director, I sometimes get on the floor and I pack the trunks. Like, it's like, you got to put in the work, be really present do research, read a lot about this industry. It's not just always looking at pictures, you know, read business of fashion, read women's wear daily, like know what's happening within the industry so you can know where you're going forward in it. Thank you. That's a, that's a great answer. Jason, what are your thoughts on that? I think, I mean, I, I'm pretty much a straight shooter and like my, my career was definitely a bit more, a bit different than most people that are in fashion. So I come from a space now by being in it for so long and working with some of the most planet shifting men and women. It's just that sometimes when, when people ask me these questions, I tell them work, work ethic trumps talent. Because a lot of times you, you, get, you can be the most talented person, but if you don't have the work ethic, you fall to the wayside. So if you are if you are a hard worker, you're focused, you're on time, like going back to, you know, you're, you're reading everything, you, you know everything, but you may not be the most talented designer, stylist, di art, fashion director, but if you have major work ethic, that pushes through everything. And those are the people that constantly get hired. Like I, I for myself, I sometimes I'm on set and I'm like, well, that person's really not that great, but you could actually see what they built from. Like they're the people who were, they were, they know everything. They're always on time. They can do your job. They can do my job. So work ethic is for me, Trump's talent. So a lot of people try to lean into their talent and talk about how fabulous they can be and how fabulous they can do things. But, you know, are you showing up on time? Are you really doing the work? Can we depend on you to come through when we ask you to pack this, get on the plane, go there, maybe sometimes not do your job because the budget doesn't allow us to have, you know, a seamstress or, you know, or, or some, a PA. So I say for me, I really think work ethic trumps talent, 
for me, 99% of the time, I, when I, when I hire people, I look at work ethic. I totally look at work ethic. And I I mean, you can, you can, there are certain parts of style and taste. Yes, you can learn, but a lot of that stuff is innate. But like, I'd rather have someone who can, who I can depend on and who can knock things out of the ballpark versus looking at someone who, who's coming in with a fabulous look on, like not really interested in that. And that's how you can propel in this business is work ethic. I just have to say when he said like put the fabulous look on, I have had interns who come in and they're like super decked out and then this like beautiful heel. And I'm like, that's great. But today we're packing trunks and there's a million errands to run. (laughs) What are you doing? Like my very first, my very first assistant would come, my very first assistant would come to to the studio every day and she would be in the most major pair of Manolo Blahniks. Like she always had a look. And I, I would just laugh to myself because I'd be like, okay, so now you have to go here, go there. Taraji needs this, Yara needs that, Serena Williams needs this. And she's like, by the end of the day, she's walking around with her shoes in her hand. But by the, the second week of working with me, she thought that like her look was going to get her to the next level um, in the office. But I'm like, no, you're, I'm looking for your work. Like I need to know. But by the next week, she had on a pair of Jordans and there you go. <laughs> yeah. One hundred percent, and that—that's I—I I, I tell a, I tell a, a version of of this story, work ethic to my students. Also, is just like you know, I would hear designers in the office uh, complain about having to go to China and and having to travel for one or two weeks. And I looked at it like you know, they're paying me to go to have this experience and to learn and to build myself. So I saw it completely different. So that work ethic, I think, is 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 huge uh, for for those starting out. So thank you for those an- those answers. Um, Let's go to the next question. So in fashion, uh, like many other industries, too often we see that Black creatives aren't afforded the same opportunities as their counterparts of other races. In certain creative spaces, we may find ourselves the only or one of few Black people in the room or any people of color in the room. Yet at the same time, Black culture, innovation, labor, and dollars are vital to the industry of fashion. So here's the question. Uh, what has been your personal experience as a Black professional in fashion, and how does that influence your work both positively and negatively? Oh, I, I, you know, I love, I love stuff like this. Okay. Um, fortunately, <laughs> fortunately, I grew up not, not seeking, I was lucky enough to grow up in a space where I did not have to seek approval for um, the whiteness, you know, I never, I, I was really, really lucky in that sense. So for me, I also never worked in such a corporate situation. I've always been an entrepreneur. So I never had to really face day to day, going in, clocking in, sitting next to someone who actually may have hated me or didn't see my work. So I was lucky in that sense. But what I have no, what I notice, and you know, I, I, I fight every day for this is that you can see the difference the way that people respond to you personally let it be email let it be meeting them for the first time there's been many a times where i've been on set and they walk right past me and they go to someone who doesn't look like me and they they assume that that is the creative director or the stylist um so those things happen and i also i i witness i witness a lot where you send out a request for a celebrity to wear something. Like for example, Taraji P. Henson, she was on this major Oscar run for Hidden Figures. She was nominated for everything. At the height of her career, she was cookie. And I would send requests and no one would respond to my request. And here it is, this woman who has, who's done everything. She's checked all the Hollywood, you know, dots. She's checked all those boxes, but the one box that was the problem box for them was that she was, she was a black woman. So I, I fought over and over and over again to you know, find the right brands that, that we connected to. And it took someone like an Edward NFL who I sat on the sofa with and he actually, Edward actually changed my career when it came to fashion because he showed me the difference of like speaking directly to these PR people who have no idea or no concept or no clue or de- who, does not even want to be a part of that world, but he connected me to designers direct mm-hmm. and it's a completely different experience. So it, at the end of the day, it's the same drama. It's the same systematic racism that people deal with from the medical business to, 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 to 
the arts to it's all the same thing. It's all the same drama of like trying to convince people that you're worthy. We've been, we've been taught that we need to convince everyone that we're worthy. But once you make that final decision to just realize that like, it's not about being invited to somewhere just to be invited to somewhere you, you go where you, you go where you like people love and need you there versus Mm -hmm. like, making sure that you're just there because you want to be a part of the mix. So I've been, I've been really lucky to work with people and women who, who honestly just don't care. We don't want, you know, we're about shifting the culture versus trying to fit into this idea that we've been sold to from the worlds of, you know, the, the worlds of the hurts, the Condé Nast, like that world of trying to be convinced that this is what, this is what we deem as important as Americans. So I've been really lucky in the sense of like, just not, and excuse my French, but just not giving a fuck. Like literally living, living and doing what makes us happy. So, I mean, I come up, I, I hit roadblocks, but those roadblocks mean absolutely nothing to me because I just knock them down and I keep going. So I, I, that's where I am with it. I don't, I don't believe in like sitting around and honestly complaining about what's going wrong in the, in the situations. I'm always about, okay, well, Time to build my own thing. Let's just do my own thing. And, and you watch people come and then you can decide to be the gatekeeper. No, you can't come now because this is what it feels like. So that's where, that's where I am with it. I don't, I don't really sit in the idea of like, you know, why, why is this happening? How come? It's just like, I'm going to change the narrative and do what I want to do. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And, that, and I, I want to let uh, Nicole jump in on this and maybe add something in on the back end. But it's great to hear that experience. You know, I think that's how many of these conversations, we're all having these conversations around the world. And, you know, many of these these individual conversations, if we can just share perspective, like you just shared, you know, how you came up, your, your direction, uh, how it affected you can change someone's perspective. And it's, it's, you know, it's one person at a time, one conversation at a time. So thank you. Um, uh, Nicole? Um- this just reminds me of a, I watched earlier this like summer, a, um, a live session with Nikki Giovanni and Dr. Angela Davis. And somebody asked, I, I don't remember who asked, but um, Nikki Giovanni answered and she said, stop asking people if you're pretty who hate you, something like that. And I just- oh God, That's I, profound. Yeah. That's so profound. Like, <laughs> you already know you. the answer. You know the know answer. answer. They don't think you're- beautiful they don't think you're pretty they don't think you're going to work your work is great because of they don't already don't like you they have this it's it stems from somewhere so deep within them so I just and I and I realized that that is how my parents raised me and I grew up in a white white town like it Same. It, was, it was just and and I think it was you know my grandfather was from the south and he they were on an army base there was an army family and I remember them saying, and my, my mom had lots of siblings. She's like, we had to be in line because we were the only black family on West Point or one of, and they were raised like that. And I think because they were raised like that, they, they chose not to raise their kids. Like you don't need acceptance. You don't need to be accepted in this white gaze, like just lead your own path. And they taught me, and my dad is, was also like a really big activist. He's always, every pr- picture I have of him, he's at a protest. Like anything before I was born, it's so crazy, but he's Haitian. So he said the first time he really experienced real racism was coming to America. So he just always taught me to like speak up and say what you feel like. I've been in meetings where they've said, you know, someone will suggest someone for a cover who is black and someone else in the meeting is like, oh, we just had one. And, and I'm and I'm like, excuse me, one what? Like, this isn't now where I work now, but this is in my past where I'm just like, you know, things like that happen. And I think it's up to us as Black people to speak up and say something. And I've never been afraid to speak up and say something um, for the most part. I was like, what do you mean by we've had one? Yeah. And, yeah. and you know, like, just just keep it going and don't, don't back down. And I think now, especially is a time where you do not back down. If you feel like someone is saying something or doing something to you that is wrong you have I mean, to yeah. speak that. you yeah. have to I mean even right now with me like I everyone went up in arms when I decided to call out Celine like I like I'm I, I have no fear like I have no fear in the idea of 
presenting the right things in wrong situations. Like you have to be, you have to go back to what Nicole's saying is you have to be able to speak up and be fine with wanting to be on the right side of history. Cause that's what this is all about. Like you have to want to end up being on the right side of history. And a lot of, a lot of people don't, don't understand that or just too terrified to even think about those options. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, I grew up in South Carolina, so, you know, we had our own version of this and in, in, in many places there are, right. But, you know, going through that, you know, my parents, similarly, my father was in the military. So, you know, he, I always was up early. We were cutting grass or doing something. There was never a time to sleep in, you know, even on a Saturday. Um, and if our grass was, was already cut, we would drive an hour and a half to cross and cut his sister's grass. So, you know, work ethic was already put in very early, but they did teach, you know, hey, listen, you know, things are not always going to be fair. Like you said, you can't sit around and complain, uh, talking, harping about the situation. They're not always going to be fair. You need to uh, be very hardworking. You need to be about your business. You need to be serious. And when you get your chance, you need to be ready to step up and do what you need to do. Fine, let your okay. work, let yeah. your work shine. Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. Exactly. All right. Thank you. Um, okay. So let's go to the next question. Um, as people of color, uh, we also we we often have to create our own opportunities. Uh, in your careers, how have you created space for yourself, and how have and how are you using your platform to create opportunities for others? I um, I don't. I can't really think of how I created space for myself. I, I think that's something I have to really think about. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe just being me and you know being driven and working really hard. It's something that was always instilled in me and speaking up and just not backing down. But I know personally, I have always looked to make sure I hire really diversely. Um, and I know it's it's often the case in this industry where it's it's very white. So I've always made sure that I'm meeting with assistants and and you know seeing like, hey, there's a black assistant. Like let me let me try and get someone on board. Let me, you know, let me give someone else this opportunity because mm-hmm. I am in a position to do that. And there, that's not always the case. Well, I've been places before where there was someone I wanted to hire and they were like, well, she has, doesn't really have any experience. And she was black. And then there was a white girl who had some experience. It was an assistant role. And I was just like, well, we're gonna hire the black girl. And they're like, well, she doesn't really have the experience. And I'm like, because no one's given her the opportunity to get the experience. And, and, this then, is an there's and then there's that's that. And then there's that. That's where you're gonna learn. <laughs> I don't need someone who was already trained by somebody else. I, it, this is an assistant role you're going to teach her and you're going to guide and you're going to mentor. And so I think mm-hmm. you have to be in that space to always mentor, to look and see who's going to be on set. I, I ask, I ask all the time, who's shooting this? Who, who are their assistants? Who's this? Like, you know, where do they come from? And it doesn't always have to be black, it could be Asian, Latina. Mm-hmm. It's, I'm looking at everyone as a whole. And I'm also really looking in those who are not in this industry, given opportunities. Yeah. Thank you. And Jason? I think it's pretty much the same for me. It's just like, I think that the way that I've made space is just being authentically myself and not shifting and wanting to change to fit into anyone's uh, comfort zone. And the, for me, the way that I've, I try to constantly work with change is that I, I'm never trying to send the elevator horizontal. Like mm-hmm. I don't wanna get off the elevator and start giving jobs that way and that way. You know, I've always, I was always been taught to send the elevator back down. So for me, it's always sending the elevator back down. I do, you know, for me, when it comes to looking for fashion assistants and it's very, it gets very difficult looking for um, anyone of color a lot of times, because unfortunately this is a very expensive business to work in. And most kids who are interns come from privilege and a lot, a lot of Brown kids don't have those opportunities to for me to say, hey, I want to send you to, I want to send you to Paris for couture. I'll I'll pay for you to get there, and you know you have to be able to feed yourself and things like that. But you have other kids with privilege where they're like, well, I'm already going to be summering in Paris, so it's fine for me to do that. So it's it's being able to send the elevator down, support those kids, give those kids opportunities, mm-hmm. and going back to what Nicole is saying, it's just like train and teach. The goal is to train and teach. So then that way, if you, if you don't, if, if you don't give those opportunities to expose people, there's no, there's no future. There's no future. You have to be exposed. You have to have opportunities. You have to teach them. You have to teach. 
And, and for me, that's, that's why I'm always sending the elevator down. When I get off, I never look left. I never look right. I never look up. I always push the button right back down because it's not fair. And a lot of times what we do is in our business, especially in the fashion world, a lot of times what happens is everybody gets off the elevator and they're passing it left and right and up versus sending it down. Mm-hmm. And especially for black people, the only 99% of us who work in this business, somebody had to send the elevator back down. It wasn't left and right. Yeah. Um, like Nicole's experience, like from coming, becoming an intern up, someone had to give her an opportunity. And same for me, like someone gave me an opportunity. So you have to, it's all about opportunities and giving people access to this very coveted secret world that we're in, if you will. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I've seen this uh, from a different angle, right? Also, you know, my wife, she's worked in New York City public schools for her whole career until we moved to Savannah to teach. And she taught on Flatbush Avenue in Brooklyn. So if you know anything about Brooklyn or you know about Flatbush Avenue, it's not the Upper West Side, right? It's, it, it can be a rough and tough area, right? There's a, there's a lot going on. But she just has such a passion for those kids. And the same thing, like you're saying, that opportunity, right? Maybe starting out at a certain level or a certain area you might be from, you may not be given that opportunity in the beginning, but she's so gifted at, at showing those kids, like channeling maybe that anger or frustration that they may be acting out and saying, hey, listen, let's put that to the side. Let's talk about this, you know? Now you have an opportunity. I'm going to work with you. Where do you want to get? How do you want to do it? And getting and breaking through that wall. So like you said, opportunity, opportunity. Um, it's, it's huge because, you know, you, cha- you shift that child's perspective or that person's perspective and introduce them to something new and give them a chance to perform. And, and you know, it's not all about uh, color because, I mean, you could be any color. And if you don't perform, you're going to get fired, yeah. right? <laughs> now you're not going to keep the job. Yeah. So it's huge. That, that is huge. Yeah, I think we all deserve a chance. And when you think of, especially for, you know, minorities, it's like you're, you're already at a deficit. So when you walk into these spaces to have someone who can offer you a position, it's to kind of take a step back and realize that a lot of these people are, a lot of these, a lot of these people who come for these jobs are from a deficit. So when you meet with the kids of privilege, of course, they've been able to intern with Chanel. Of course, they've been able to intern with KCD without being paid and have an apartment down the street where, you know, you have to be, you have to think about, you have to think about these things and give everyone a chance, an opportunity. Like Nicole, that's like, yes, I need, I need her because I, this is the time where you can groom someone and it's the possibility. Like that is the American dream, right? Mm-hmm. To be able to groom someone and give them that opportunity. We all want to hear that story. And not as often we get to hear it when it comes to fashion. I mean, you hear it all the time in the music world, but you don't really hear that a lot in fashion. Yeah. Thank you. Um, all right. So, and uh, so, you know, we're seeing uh, many public reckonings uh, with the systemic racism and fashion following the Black Lives Matter protests. Uh, many brands and organizations are pledging support for the movement. Uh, on social media and promising, uh, promising more inclusion and representation. Uh, social media has been a powerful tool, not only in building a movement like Black Lives Matter, um, but in calling out injustice, both in our everyday and uh, on the highest level. So here's the question, uh, with the fashion industry's relationship to social media, uh, sorry, with the, with the fashion industry's relationship to social media change with influence of i'm so sorry let me recap that one more time will the fashion industry's relationship with social media change with the influence of black lives matter protests uh as well as with the pandemic uh i think you know what i think i listen i think that accountability is it has enhanced even more just with social media, right? You were, everyone's able to kind of have a, everyone's able to have a voice um, and have a point of view when it comes to things like this. So accountability now, I think is, it's, it's going, it's, it's like, it's so visible now. So I think a lot of brands are, are gonna be very con- conscious and cautious about what they do and how they do just because of backlash. I, I, for me, I, I hope that it's not just because of just for optics. I really mm-hmm. hope that they're really, really doing the work. Mm-hmm. Um, and as we've seen, there's a lot of brands that were doing it just for optics. 
But the magic with social media now is that people can ask people for receipts, you know, and fashion was one of the la one of the only places where there's not a there's not a space where we can go to and say, you know, a board or a committee that you can go to and say, this isn't fair. Mm -hmm. It's one of the only places still that we, we really don't have that. So I think with the social media, it's, it's, it's magical because now we have the opportunity to hold people accountable and have visual, visual moments where we can say, no, this isn't true. Or yes, look at the shift that they're, they're doing with their business. Mm -hmm. And Nicole? I mean, I don't, I don't know what else to add to that. It's, it's perfect. It's, there's such a call out and cancel culture. So I think that um, brands are going to have to change the way they work and do business and it cannot be fake anymore. It is, it is too easy to be called out and quickly canceled. And I think that um, they're afraid of that. So they're going to do the work, but I, I want to see them do the work on the inside. I don't want to see their black square. I don't want to see now, now all of a sudden they're, like their ad campaigns are just all shot on black models and things like that. I want to, I want to hear from the employees that are working from the inside and I want yeah. to see that they're actually doing the work and not just hiring black assistants, but hiring black executives and, and more people of color throughout the, the line of command so that yeah. everyone's, it's like we're, we're storytellers. So if all the storytellers come from one set of culture, the story, mm -hmm. the story is not getting told correctly. Yeah. So I think yeah. that's important. So I think brands will, are going to start to pay attention to that. I mean, Nicole, to even piggyback on that, even just that, the idea of like what you see now in a lot of brands, um, social media, it's like, it's almost like this, this dump of black culture, like out of nowhere. It's for me, it's like, it feels so unauthentic and it just, it, it's like, it, you, you can have a voice, you can have a, you can have a black voice, but it just like now after, after you go through these three, you know, these three or six months of posting this, then do you go back to normal? Because then I'm going to question that. So it's just like, just be conscious and, fi and find your voice in that, in, uh, in that place, find your voice. It doesn't have like, cause I'm so confused. I see so many things on social. I'm like, Whoa, that's weird. Whoa, that's weird. Whoa, that's weird. And then it's like, so I'm just kind of like, is this a band aid? Oh, hi, Lynn. Hi, Lynn. Lynn. Sorry, hi, Jason. Hi, Lynn. Hi. I also <laughs> notice, um, cause I, I, I have like a really good memory. So I remember the runway shows. I remember I remember brands who were putting in the work and who weren't from what I can visually see. Yeah. And I noticed that the brands who were always inclusive never felt the need to post a black square, mm. never felt the need to make a corporate statement because they were already doing the work. Mm -hmm. So it's the ones that had to really make those statements that I'm really scrutinizing and looking at like, okay, I want to see where you are in three months, in six months, in a year, in a few years. Like I'm, I'm keeping tabs. Same. <laughs> and, and, I'm calling and, them and, out. Like I, I've now like even become more aggressive where I'm like, I've noticed that anytime we request for a black talent, you're not approving. Like who, who's not approving? Is it you on the PR side? Is it someone above you? Is it the designer? I want I want to know. And I think they're, they're really, I do it. Listen, I'm here for it. <laughs> and I notice my white colleagues are doing the same thing. Like sometimes they bring it to my attention. They're like, I think that brand's racist. And they're, right. and they well, let us listen, know. I have, yeah. I had a, I had a, I had a, um, I had a white assistant who never had a, worked for a black stylist before. And she would come back and she would be like, she would look at me and she would like, I'm like, what? She was like, I think they're racist. I'm like, why? She was like, because when I worked with so-and-so, they would give so-and-so everything and then they won't give. And I'm like, I was like, oh, welcome. This is what it feels like. I was like, you have to do extra steps over here versus when you work with a Carla Walsh or Elizabeth Stewart, it's completely different over here. But the magic is now, the magic is like, we have choices. We have choices. Now it's up to you to say no. Like for us, it's more important. It's not, it's not about the yeses, it's about the noes at JSM Studio. Like that's all, we're, we're like, no, no, pass, 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 pass. <laughs> I now, I forward back the same emails. People will send me things for, for Yara or Storm Reed. And I'm like, oh, remember? Uh, Designer like, is not a you. sorry. <laughs> yeah, like, thank you, sorry. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's not our market. We're not targeting that right now. So you have to, you have to take your power back. And that's the magic of, 
this moment and even the magic of what you know Lindsay has created with uh, with the council and even I, I even like to say this going back to what I keep saying about sending that elevator back down Lindsay you don't know this but maybe you do Lindsay may this is what Lindsay did she sent the elevator back down Lindsay and I just knew each other like just Lindsay was just studying like what's happening in, in, in black culture mm -hmm. and I'm happy I have goosebumps because Lindsay called me and I'll never forget she called me she was like I want to give you a cover and I was like what and it was Serena Williams and it was Serena oh. Williams was one she was on my vision board she was one of my dream clients and Lindsay did it and that goes back to the biggest conversation, you have to send it back down. And at this point, when Lindsay got off the elevator, Lindsay could have looked left and right, but she looked down and she mm -hmm. sent that elevator down and she gave, she gave me an opportunity. And thank you, Lindsay, because that was one of, the mo one of my favorite moments. And then it led me to now have a larger relationship with brands like Armani, which custom gowns for, for Serena Williams for the Oscars. So, that's how the trickle down works. And that's what we have to do. We have to put in the work. So Lindsay did that for me. And now all I do is every time I have these moments, I'm always pushing the button to go back down because this is what happens. These are pure examples of when people sent the elevator back down. So thanks, Lens. Of course. No, I, I love it. I think that, I mean, this is such a crazy moment in time. Like it's, it's wild, but like, like, I'm glad that we're having this reckoning of sorts. And I'm really glad that, you know, we're having to push a lot of these things. I think that a lot of these conversations, like, I, I love that we're taking that power back. I think that's so important. And that's so key because even, you know, I was having a conversation about some, some beauty ideas the other day. And I'm like, look, I mean, you can't tell me my curl pattern. So let's not just even have this conversation. Like do the work, you can come back to me. <laughs> like, yeah. um, I, I don't need to do this. Like you, you want to post that you're reading white fragility and you want me to be impressed and I'm not. Like I, I'm happy that you're reading a book. I'm not a hater. It's, it's just like, white I want to... <laughs> right. I'm like, I, I'm happy that you're, you're trying to do some things that like, you don't need to post every, you know, woke textbook that you're reading or everything that you're really trying to do, like really do the work and understand that like when you're an editor, like just like we're fashion editors and we know like, you know, all the brands and we know like we do the research of like finding new brands, finding, you know, emerging brands, mm -hmm. reaching out to black designers, like all editors should be doing that. Like you shouldn't just now be like, oh, let me write up the 15 black brands because it's Black History Month or because we're dealing with this time in culture right now. Like it's, it's the same thing and I think that really forcing that and like coming back to that of like okay yeah you may have written this thing about black brands but like have you reached out to them to try to establish a relationship like are you calling the clothes in are you you know trying to push for them to be included in like oh somebody said they need like this brand or whatever looking like some you know looking for something specific for this cover this opportunity like are you going past just the performative surface level of saying that you're doing something and I think that that's where we all are now. So we're all just like, look, if you're not doing the real work, like we're not interested. Yeah. 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 And, and it's, it's, you know, like you said, it's, it's not about a post or a big grandiose promise or uh, a, on the big stage, you know, saying we're going to do this and that it really is just down to individual daily life, everyday decisions, you know, the small decisions, the things that nobody sees, you know, how do you react? And that's really what it's about. Um, you know, at, at this moment. And I think it's, it's, uh, I think there are a pocket of people who uh, were maybe some somewhat oblivious. I don't think you can be 100% oblivious, but somewhat oblivious to it. Maybe you just grew up in a holy part of a place that's, that's isolated, and you just never really dealt with it. And it's on your radar, right? But most people were somewhere somewhat aware. And then so now it's just like, okay, um, it, it was kind of a weird thing, I think. But now it's like, big companies are having these conversations openly, which, you know, who knows if it's genuine or not genuine, but I think the good thing is that it is happening, right? And now we have more of a chance to actually make some change because I think we've all been at the table where, you know, you're looking around, you're like, man, I might be the only one here or, or any person of color. And it just puts a certain weight on you. So I think that uh, it, it's all good. And thank you for those, those comments, Lindsay. Lindsay, I'm going to throw one more to you. Uh, here, because I think uh, I, I think this one is just for you. So um, 
you know, you've guided Teen Vogue to become an industry-wide uh, model for status quo change, changing content, and you're reaching quite a broad intersectional audience. How is Teen Vogue responding to the protests, um, the protests on social media? Yeah, it's funny. I mean, um, so many brands have, uh, brands and people have reached out and like other, you know, advertisers and like, what is your new strategy? We don't have a new strategy. We've always mm -hmm. been doing this. Um, that's the best thing about doing the work because we've already been doing the work. So we've already been prepared and ready. And it's honestly business as usual for us. Um, we regularly talk about Black Lives Matter all the time on Team Vogue. So it, it, it didn't just appear a couple months ago. Um, I mean, we, we've talked, I mean, we've been talking about voter suppression, everything. Like it, it's crazy to me that I think um, people have just now like realized that, yeah, you can be interested in fashion, but you also, you know, can care about the world. Like we're all multifaceted human beings. Like, yes, I love to take a moment, but like, I am really passionate about getting Trump out of the White House this November. Like you can care about both and both be really important to you. And so I think that our strategy really, especially on social media has just been to read the room and, and use our platform um, to amplify voices that others aren't. I think also in, the, in these kind of moments, like I think it's great that celebrities have been, you know, letting people use their platform and like, oh, we found some activists, et cetera. But like, we've been featuring all these people on our site for years. So it was more about like, okay, let's amplify some new voices in this space that people don't know about and haven't, you know, they, they realize like this person has a huge following and that's who they want to do their thing with. But I think we were all like, okay, let's feature a lot of the grassroots organizers that we've already featured on the site, but people aren't, you know, giving the Instagram lives to and aren't, you know, giving those opportunities to, um, you know, let's talk to the people on the ground who are protesting and who are, you know, you know, being really part of this to make sure that it's not just a moment and that it is a larger movement. Um, so it really wasn't, I mean, I felt like everybody during this whole time was like, how did we pivot? And we were kind of like, we're going to do the same thing, just amp it up. I mean, it wasn't really a shift for us. And could you also talk a bit about the council? Yeah. Um, a lot of the Black and Fashion Council, I'm super excited. We're officially um, going to be launching on Monday. And I'm, I'm super excited because it's been a long time coming. But I think a lot of the, the conversations we've just been having over the past couple of years have been like, how do we move forward? How do we, you know, how do we actually see progress in the industry? And I think that um, we just had, you know, so many conversations with people in the industry. I'm saying we, as Sandrine and I, of like, you know, what do people really want these brands to be doing? How can we hold them accountable? You know, I'm not, you know, trying to like cancel every single brand. We love fashion, but like, how do we make them know that this is a priority and that they really need to make inclusivity the lens in which they see everything like every decision that you should be making is inclusive in your business plan and so um, through a lot of different conversations um, we came up with like this twofold plan of you know working with our executive board um, which is you know all these amazing people like Nicole who are doing incredible things in the industry to really you know be that feedback counsel resource etc on helping these brands just understand a lot of things that they Feel like they have but then they clearly don't especially because we all work with them and we're like what like how do you not understand like basic things anymore um and then you know we have a really great ad advisory board that jason is a part of um of people really of people that you know we're really like looking to as far as our you know overseeing and guidance and and getting their and getting their advice on like how we really move this forward of like, you know, having these relationships with all these brands. And I think a lot of us have felt like, oh, you know, I'm cool with this one PR person or I'm cool with this person, whatever, but like the brand itself isn't really making all the changes and like, we're not seeing enough progress. And, you know, they'll, they'll have this one really great moment, but then they'll have a campaign that's like really tone deaf. And you're like, how do we, how do we mesh this relationship to make it make sense? Um, and so we're, you know, incorporating that with having a ton of more conversations. Um, and then we're partnering with the human rights campaign on a custom um, corporate equality index survey that we're really excited about because I think a lot of people have really 
in the past few years just wanted more accountability and transparency from brands of like who actually works there like who is in the atelier like your campaign may be really diverse and beautiful but like who's actually making all this who's actually making decisions behind the scenes and so we wanted to make you know a custom survey with them to actually allow brands to be more transparent about who is actually, you know, part of this company and actually then, you know, assist them in the pipeline and making it better of like, you know, a lot of these companies have a ton of black assistants, but none of them are really ever promoted. Like, and I think a lot of that comes from the fact that there hasn't been this accountability to them to push of like, you have the numbers in diversity, you know, but you don't, there, the inclusion is not there. Like diversity doesn't ensure inclusion. So like you can have the numbers, but like, how many of these people are just then like freelancers or assistants and they're never put in a position of success and they're never put in a position to be promoted. They're not C-suite executives, they're not senior level executives. And like what we're doing is really challenging that but offering a ton of resources. The human rights campaign is great and they're offering a ton of you know listening sessions about how to really bring all these policies into practice and how brands have done it in a really successful way. And um, I'm really excited. Like a lot of brands are actually committing to like, look, like, you know, we've had this moment here and we've had this moment here, but we need we need to commit to longer, you know, sustainable change. So it's exciting. Thank you. And then I think we're getting um, right on the tail end of it. So I have one more question for each of you. Um, so I'd like to ask each of you, what advice have you received that you continue to carry with you and what words can you offer to students listening now to help them trust themselves and know their value in a changing industry? Uh, Jason, would you like to start off with that one? Uh, I guess the, I, I'm just going to maybe lean into the value of it all. Mm -hmm. No one can give you value. value. Like That's the first thing you have to know. No one can give you value. And the, the only way that you can get to the next level is you have to ultimately trust yourself so you have to let everything go and trust yourself that's that i mean that's for me that's that's i i don't seek validation and when it comes to trust i look within and that's the not to get you know dalai lama but that's for me that's what has gotten me through everything i ask my i i, I trust my instincts because that's that's the that's the only thing that you can really um lean into and also surround yourself with surround yourself with, with like-minded people and people that you can actually learn from mm -hmm. you know that's for me that's that's what I could give everyone study okay. study read read don't look for validation look within and surround yourself with awesome people all right thank you thank you Nicole oh you have you're muted uh, this is kind of tough, but one thing I learned from a former boss was to ask the question and that I feel like can go like small to really big. Like you always constantly ask questions, constantly just like get all the information you can, get all of your resources, know everything, like know everything about the situation you're in. Just keep asking, whether it's like, like say you're up for a new job. This is a, an age, especially of people of color and women. We don't under we don't know salaries, so start asking. Be be open about it. Ask the question. For me, it's like sometimes I'm like a brand will be like that look isn't available. Why? Why isn't available? Why isn't this? Why isn't that? Like just you have to ask the question and like just stay really. I don't know. It's like you almost like you stay curious and it keeps you keeps you going. Like stay. A, it's almost like you're staying a student. Like just let the knowledge pour in. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And um, let's give Lindsay, Lindsay uh, a chance to answer that as well. Um, I think especially like, adv like advice that we need in today's day and age with like Instagram and stuff is like knowing that like what's for you is for you. And I know that we all know that, but I think that like especially as uh, people of color and specifically black people, like I want us to get to a place where we all really feel like we can see each other win and support each other and be happy for each other and know that like there is a lane and a destiny for each and every one of us. And 
um, you know, it, I feel like we we all know when you look on Instagram that people are, you know, showing you that perfect snapshot of their life. But I think that it is like realizing like, you know what, like when it's my time, it's going to be my time. Like what's for you is for you. And like focusing on that and like what, you know, what you're bringing to the table that no one else is, I think is always the key because like, it's so easy to compare and it's so easy to look at like other brands and other people. And you're like, Oh wait, like how, what, like I'm trying to do this, et cetera, et cetera. But um, comparison can kill that joy so easily that like you inherently have in your heart and soul. And I think that when you just stop doing that and you really focus on like, you know, what your purpose is and like what you're trying to do, it, it all falls in line. Thank you. Thank you. And um, all right. So Hannah, I think you have the poll question. Yes, I do. Um, the winning poll question was actually how the fashion industry is responding to the Black Lives Matter movement, which you guys kind of sort of covered. So we're going to yeah. hop in um, to the questions from the audience to give them more time to be answered. And the first question was historically in the Black church has been, the Black church has been in Black culture. Um, how has the church kind of influenced the world of fashion in the way you guys see it? I mean, Sunday, Sunday, your, I mean, your Sunday's best, right? That's when everybody pulled out the big guns, right? That was the opportunity to have a fashion show when most, most people were working every day. So there was a moment to kind of shine and, and celebrate. And that's what fashion is ultimately about, right? It's, a, it's, the, it's, it's that moment to, to live and create this character that, that you deeply love about yourself that a lot of people don't get to see so often. So I think that it's the moment you look at everything from what Marc Jacobs does to Jean-Paul Gaultier to Dior, like a lot of those references are, are there. And even, I mean, just currently now you look at what a lot of people are doing, you know, Christopher John Rogers, those images that he does from his collection reminds me of things that like my dad, mom would wear like huge skirts and, you know, things like that. So I think it's, it's a, it's a perfect black fashion reference for us. Thank you. Um, so question number two, if you could see any one change in the fashion industry tomorrow, um, whether that be an executive appointment or some type of access, uh, what would it be? Like, what would be your one point of change that you would love to see um, tomorrow if you could? I would like for there to be more Black designers that are being funded and backed and given these like grand opportunities to show at New York Fashion Week, to show in Paris, to be the helm of a, of a really old school house. Like, I just think that there just isn't enough of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that, that, that that's like, it's why it was so iconic when Virgil, you know, got that appoint, you know, was appointed with that position because it was just never before seen or, or really televised like that when, when he got that opportunity. So I totally agree with you, Nicole. It was just like, did this really just happen? Like did, did you know, one of those helm old fashioned houses really take that step? And um, that's, that's, that's big. So that would be a great one to see. And something else I noticed too, I was doing something. I'm like, where are the black women designers? Like. Mm. I know that's what I was gonna say. I was, really, I was gonna that's say what that. I was really getting at. I know you brought up Virgil, but that's what I was really getting at. Like, where did they yeah. go? Like, yeah, it just is. It's all. It's like, I, I, I would love. I actually studied history in school, and I would love to just do the research. It's like, I know what happened to black teachers, but where did the black women fashion designers go? Oh, like the woman who designed Jackie Onassis' wedding dress. Do you guys understand? Yeah. Like she yeah. was the force. Like she was like, this is one thing I try to tell a lot of black kids who ask me questions about like the chicness of it all because they've been convinced that whiteness equals chic. And I was like, no baby, let me like, you know, the idea of American chicness is Jackie no, Onassis, crazy. but Jackie Onassis pulled her chicness from this black woman that was doing everything. So that actual idea of what we see of Onassis came from this designer, this black woman who was up, who was uptown making these dresses for all these, you know, aristocrats and socialites. So mm -hmm. where are they? Like, I want to see one like the head of Dior, the head of um, Givenchy. Like, I want to see that because the possibility is there because those are my references. That That's what I grew up on. <laughs> so that's, I mean, like so I'm today, with you. If I were to go to my, see my grandmother who is 95, she is sitting in her house in a look. Like that's what she, 
She's dressed. Listen, my first, ex yeah, my first experience with fashion was with my grandmother pulling fur coats off of a rack inside of Saks Fifth Avenue. And then her, you know, my grandmother buying couture, but she had to buy one of her white girlfriends because they wouldn't let my grandmother buy couture from Dior. Mm -hmm. So these are the stories, like, that's what I know. So that's what I grew up with. Like the idea that my grandmother was outside, like, in her garden with a high-waisted chino and a gingham shirt tucked. Basically what Lindsay and Nicole yeah. have on up top, that's what my grandmother was giving with a khaki and a flat, like a major penny loafer. And like, those are my visions. And that's when I think when people are like, what are your references for your red carpet? I'm like, well, I gotta go back to my grandmother and my mom. Like, <laughs> if, I, if, I could, if I could formulate that for a carpet and they were doing it with ease, that's what magic is. That's what chic is. That's what fashion is. You know, so going back, Nicole, I want to see that too. <laughs> also, and then uh, Lindsay, I think you were jumping in on that one. Well, I was just going to say, no, I remember um, it, it is about like, like knowing the history as well, because as a child, like I would go to the Ebony Fashion Fair with my parents and that was like, I got to just dress up. They rented me a limo. Like I thought yeah. I was top notch. Okay. Like it was everything. And you got to see all this, you know, all this couture, all these brands, like, and you know, buyers like specifically like talking about black women in Givenchy. And like I think that we just don't have those those moments anymore. But I, I totally agree with Nicole. Like I want I want to see a black woman designer rise. Yeah. I I love everything that you guys have said. Um our next question is if you could give a point of advice for emerging professionals, many of whom are watching today, what would it be to, what would it be not only to be, what do you need not only to be success, but to make sure your voice is always heard? Um, I feel like when you guys were talking a bit earlier about calling people out and um, having those conversations, how can we make sure our voices are always heard, um, even if we're not in such like high level positions as well? I mean, it's going back to you. We all have these platforms now. We all have the social media platforms. So that 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 in itself is enough. Like things go viral all day. So don't be afraid to to amplify that voice on, on those platforms. I when it comes to 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 those type of things, I always lead try to lead with facts, numbers, receipts, and not really with emotions a lot of the times. Because what happens sometimes when you lead with emotions you don't ever get to your point because you're, you're, you're so strong on these things. So I always say when it's time, when you're in those rooms, just hit people with facts. It's all about facts. There's no need to be emotional about it because the facts are the facts. So when you have those spaces and you're in those opportunities, just hit everybody with facts. They can't turn away from that. Yeah, I think, I think a lot about, you know, it, it can be really emotional when you're the only black person in these spaces and trying to get your point across because you're like, why doesn't anybody else understand this? But I, I always take a moment to really think like, okay, there are gonna be times that I need to put my feet to the fire on something. Like, is that this time? Like, am I really willing to put my feet to the fire and let them burn for this? And sometimes I am, and sometimes I'm like, you know what? I can, I'm gonna communicate like in a very, professional slightly petty way how I feel and leave it alone um but I think you have to choose those times of like when you're going to kind of turn up and when you're not because I think that in reality like these journeys are going to be really frustrating and you can't you know you can't like walk in that every single day but I think that you know being wise about those when you choose to have those moments is really important it's like a little bit to me of like playing a game of chess and you have to build your strategy, get all your information, like Jason's saying, know your, to get the facts together and just let them know, like just, just come across like really strong. And I think it doesn't matter if you're an assistant, speak to, speak to the person who's right above you. Start there. They're not listening, go above them. Like there's certain, there's certain circumstances where you just need to speak up. And I've, I've been in a situation as an assistant where I just didn't feel comfortable and mm -hmm. I wasn't, at that time, I wasn't even sure if it was race related or just like fashion is an industry where people can just be mean. So you, I think you, ha you have to like, I don't know. It's like you, you need to, to like put aside like, okay, that person's just being mean and like speak up for what is right. Like know how you should be treated and just speak your mind and just keep going and, and don't back down. And I think 
really, as I was saying before, now is a time where you do not have to feel like you should keep quiet, let it go, speak up your mind, speak up. <laughs> and then we have our last question. How do we keep the empowerment of the Black Lives Matter movement consistent instead of letting it become something for the moment or just a fad? Um, this is not a fad. This is, it's, it's up to us as Black people. It's up to mm -hmm. our white allies, our Asian allies, our, all, all of it. We, ha we will keep it going. Like, it's just, I, I think it's something different. Um, I think it's something really different than it has been in the past. It's almost like a, I wouldn't say like my parents' generation, they really got out there and they fought and they fought and they fought for a lot of things. And, you know, things kind of die down. But I think right now we're at the very beginning of this movement and we have to make sure it stays public, it stays out there. And it's like, we have a tool now that they didn't have. We have the internet now mm -hmm. we have instagram now we have you know facebook live and um facetime and everything where you can get information out really quickly and and letting everybody know now so we have the prime opportunity to to keep it going and also so many people are unemployed they got time we have time and we're really yeah. like i just feel like i was like i've talked to my dad i've talked to my grandfather he's almost 100 and he was like you guys have time. He's like, before when I was growing up, I didn't have time because I had to go to work. I had six kids. I had to do this. I was like, you know, sending letters when I could. But right now you guys have the time to keep mm -hmm. it going. Mm -hmm. I think it's all, I, I, I lean to the idea of it's, you, we, we can only take care of us. So it's up to black folks to, keep the train going, not expect everybody to jump on, not looking for people to jump on. You just got to keep going. Like there's, there's no need to look to your left and look to your right and trying to make sure that your, you know, your white counterparts, your Asian counterparts, your it's just like, you got to, we got to go. Like there's no time to wait. We got to go. So as long as we keep going, people is just like with anything, when it comes to style and culture and things like that, everybody jumps on anyway. So I, my, 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 little bit of of it is just keep going just mm -hmm. keep going that was a word jason you like that lens yeah that was a word. <laughs> hair flip you like that hair flip <laughs> <laughs> um so that wraps it up for this panel i loved hearing from you guys you guys have such amazing energy that you bring into the room um thanks again to all of you and our moderator and thanks for everyone for joining us up next at 2 p.m. is our third and final Pass the Mic panel entitled Behind the Lens, featuring photographer, director, and SCAD alum Christian Cody, major face founder and makeup artist T. Cooper, and social media strategist and founder of Black and Corporate Candace Marie Stewart. The panel will be moderated by Reed, <laughs> fashion director of Bustle Digital Group, and it's going to be an amazing conversation. Yay. Yeah, I, I'm excited too. One of my, she used to be my intern, that Tiffany Reed. Oh, that's awesome. See, see, see what I mean? <laughs> Set that elevator right down. I elevator right down. And you know what? I still mentor her. And she has now also become a mentor to me. So you got to. I love that. I just want, I also want to say, I just thank you guys for giving me the time to enjoy these beautiful Black women. Nicole and Lindsay, like I get like, we're, again, I said this early on. It's just like, now we actually get to see each other and actually really get to talk and connect. Because in this business, it's just go, 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 go. And you hear names and you see photos and that's it. But to actually meet people who are who are on the same vibration and speak the same language as you, I'm I'm grateful that you guys created this platform for us to all be together. I love you. We love and you. And I you. Yeah. <laughs> Bye guys. All right. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's been a blessing. <laughs>